Welcome to the Quillette Podcast. I'm your host, Jonathan Kay, a senior editor at Quillette. Quillette is where free thought lives. We are an independent grassroots platform for heterodox ideas and fearless commentary. If you'd like to support the podcast, you can do so by going to quillette.com and becoming a paid subscriber. This subscription will also give you access to all our articles and early access to Quillette social events. And this week, I'm going to start off with some exciting news. The birth of another forthcoming Quillette podcast stream called Quillette Narrated, which, as the title suggests, will consist of narrated adaptations of selected articles from our Quillette.com website. Quillette Narrated will be broadcasting on a separate podcast stream, so if you're interested in signing up, you'll need to access the Quillette Narrated feed separately in your podcast software once it launches. The first episode should be appearing in the next few weeks. And by the way, we are still looking at options for narrators. So if you have any suggestions, feel free to let me know by emailing me at john, J-O-N, at quillette.com. I love hearing from listeners about all sorts of subjects, and I try to respond to all of you, if, that is, I can think of something interesting or helpful to say in response. If I can't, don't take it personally. And now let's hear from this week's guest, aspiring British therapist James Esses, who in 2021 was summarily expelled from his training program at the Metanoia Institute in London after he voiced support for a candid debate within his profession about the best way to treat transgender-identified youth. Specifically, Mr. Esses expressed concern about using prohibitions on conversion therapy as a means to block good-faith, holistic therapeutic practices that aim to help gender dysphoric children and their families understand a child's distress. At the time, it's worth pointing out, the Metanoia Institute was quite proud of the way it dismissed Mr. Esses, tweeting out as follows, quote, Whilst we do not publicly comment on our internal processes, today we have terminated a student's membership to Metanoia Institute. We reshare our recent LGBT plus history statement and reaffirm our full support for the MOU opposing conversion therapy." With me to discuss all this is James Esses himself. We spoke in January over Skype. Here are excerpts from our conversation. So when did your ordeal start? Yeah, so it started back at the tail end of 2021. And actually, it involved you and Colette, John, interestingly enough, because... Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> I, was, uh, I was training to be a therapist. I was, I was on my master's degree, and I was becoming more and more concerned by gender ideology and the impact on the mental health professions and on children. And I actually, I wrote an article at the time for Quillette. It was called The Real Conversion Therapy. And I was arguing that actually, far from therapists, it was puberty blockers, hormones, and uh, sex reassignment surgery that was converting people into things that they weren't. And that basically started the entire ordeal because off the back of that, I did a petition to the UK government on the subject. I wrote to my therapy regulatory body with a copy of that article actually asking for a, an open dialogue and debate on these topics uh, and it wasn't long after this that I found myself expelled from my masters and basically excommunicated from the, the therapy profession in the United Kingdom. When you say gender ideology hmm. tell me what that means. Anything which challenges the, the fact that sex is binary and immutable and particularly in terms of the therapeutic perspective that I'm approaching this from, anything that's suggesting to young children that it is possible to be born in the wrong body, that it's possible to be trapped in the wrong body, and that it is possible in some way to transition to the other sex or to no sex at all, you know, particularly around times of puberty, which we all know from our own experiences is you know, unsettling, uncertain. Often children feel disconnected with their own bodies. They don't like the ways in which they're changing. But the answer to that has always been to simply empathise and support that young person through that rather than telling them, well, actually, we've got a pill for that. Don't worry, you can just pause your puberty altogether. A pill or a knife, in fact. Yeah. So as we're having this conversation, the UK government, as I understand has just vetoed, if that's the right word, or blocked a piece of Scottish legislation that 
would have served to permit unfettered self-identification as the basis for deciding who gets to go into protected female spaces. Doesn't that signal that your viewpoint maybe is getting more of a hearing these days? The fact that the UK government have decided to block this legislation in Scotland is huge. And it was a brave step because it's going to cause serious friction with Scotland and, you know, the leadership in Scotland are already trying to seek independence and break away from the United Kingdom, and this will only make that worse. So, But in Scotland, does the orthodox, if you will, orthodox Scottish position actually hold sway with the general public in Scotland? Or is this one of these issues where the Twitter hashtagger class is actually out of touch with how ordinary Scottish people feel about the issue? Well, well as with so much of these topics, any polling that has been done, including in Scotland, suggests that the majority of the population are against things such as you know legislation that allows people to self-identify as whatever sex they like but the high priests and priestesses within Scotland including the first minister Nicola Sturgeon are still pushing this I think partly to virtue signal as is so often the case these days and partly to support their overarching aim which is to break away from the United Kingdom because they can say to their supporters well you know those nasty people in London and England who uh, aren't allowing these trans people their rights you know we're nothing like them. As I say it was a very brave decision by the UK government and I was very surprised but very pleased to see it but what we encountered less than 24 hours later was an announcement by the UK government that they would now be pushing forward with a ban on quote-unquote conversion therapy for gender identity, which is something that they assured us last year that they were not going to do. And I have real concerns about the fact that this might end up criminalising therapists and even parents who do not affirm their children down a medical pathway. For people who are a little confused about the terminology here, the idea of conversion therapy has properly been condemned in the context of sexual orientation, where you take somebody who's gay and give him, quote, quote, unquote, therapy to turn him straight. It's, I think it's widely acknowledged that that is a destructive, retrograde and <laughs> ineffective process. Hmm. That term, however, has been co-opted in some context by those who suggest that any refusal to instantly affirm a trans presenting child as their presented new identity, that unless you affirm them immediately, that that can somehow be called conversion therapy in the context of gender. Is, is that the kind of co-option you're talking about? That's what I'm talking about. And that is the fear, uh, the unintended consequence of this legislation, because what it's doing is it's conflating sexual orientation with I'm going to say gender dysphoria, which is a mental health condition. These two things should be kept completely separate from one another. And yes, they're grouped together, you know, which is no surprise given the fact that we've got the kind of never dying acronym LGBT plus, you know, these things get grouped together. Quillette readers have become familiar with this term forced teaming, yes. whereby certain letters in, in the LGBT, well, ever expanding LGBT acronym is they're required or at least pressured to exhibit solidarity with other members. Exactly. Uh, it's a very strange thing. You know, I've, I so often see as activists saying there's no LGB without the T. I mean, basically saying, unless you're with us, you know, in our eyes, you, you don't even exist in many ways. <laughs> they're denying their existence, to borrow a phrase. Which is, ironic and one of the many inconsistencies of this movement but but yes i mean going back to your original point there's a real fear about the slippery slope of such legislation particularly because you, you you cannot legislate for what you cannot define and in the united kingdom at least we are struggling to define the most basic of words like male female sex or gender so how on earth can we legislate effectively and then there's a concern looking at other jurisdictions that have passed similar legislation. They often tout Australia uh, as a kind of beacon of success. But in Victoria, Australia, their Human Rights Commission recently published guidance that said that parents who do not support their children in taking puberty blockers or cross-sex hormones, if they say they're trans, could be guilty of the offence of conversion therapy. So, you know, this is really quite terrifying. Uh, the slippery slope that we could go down here. Even to such extent that the general political climate maybe is making it easier for people at least to have a, a debate about these issues, I guess that doesn't provide much solace to somebody who is in a regulated profession, such as yourself, 
where the gatekeepers in that profession or informal cliques and networks that control access to the field, if they're beholden to a certain ideological viewpoint, to a certain extent, it doesn't matter what the wider political atmosphere is. Is that the situation maybe you find yourself in uh, as a therapist? Yes, well, that's exactly what I've encountered. The, the training for therapists in the UK now is based on this idea of gender fluidity. And it's been taught as if that's fact, which is concerning for a profession that is meant to be solid when it comes to mental health. You know, any form of debate or discussion is, is, is in effect shut down. What I was expelled for was this petition, this article concerning conversion therapy legislation and some of the concerns that I've already raised with you. I was expelled for that over an email without any hearing, without any appeal. Which, 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 which institution was that? So it's, it's called the Metanoia Institute, because therapy in the UK is taught in these standalone institutions. It's accredited by a university uh, in London called the University of Middlesex. The irony is the government, at least in the immediate aftermath, did exactly what it was that I was requesting them to do in my petition. So it, it, uh, you find yourself in a strange position in which the majority of the public can be with you, and the government of the day might even implement legislation or safeguards that you are calling for and yet you can still be effectively cancelled and excommunicated by your own profession. I'm not sure if there's an analogy in other ideological movements where you can articulate the mainstream view of the majority of the population, including the elected government, and that's seen as a heresy. Uh, maybe like during the height of the Black Lives Matter, there was some kind of analogy there on matters of race. But are you aware of any other ideological movement where, where this analogy might stand up? No, although I do believe that there are overlaps between this ideology and other forms of kind of postmodernism and you know, critical race theory and all the rest of it in terms of how they approach the debate. I, I, I can't think of anything quite as stark as this, but it, it's treated with an almost religious fervor. And, you know, it's very interesting because when I was, when I was expelled the same evening, my institution took to Twitter and they, they publicized my expulsion for all to see a kind of like public shaming. And alongside that, they posted what they called a statement of solidarity with the LGBT community you know, very much like us against them and trying to signal to everyone how virtuous and, and holy they are. What's very strange about this is many of the most prominent skeptics in regard to what you've called gender ideology, and I think I've used that term before, are themselves, especially lesbian women, but also gay men. I, I should also say, here in Canada, we, we have this this odd thing, it's it's uh, what's it called? Drag queen story time hour, where, where where drag queens read books to to elementary school kids. Which, if they want to do it, that's fine. I, I find it a little strange, but I don't think the kids are, are harmed by it. But anyone who who <laughs> who says what I just said, which is that it's a little odd, they're accused of being anti LGBT, even though drag queens are not necessarily lesbian, gay, bisexual, or trans. I mean, there obviously there's an overlap in the cabaret community or whatnot. But it's like anytime anyone expresses any idea or political sentiment that's even somewhat at odds in the like general penumbra of gender or sex presentation, it's seen as like this generalized assault on anybody who identifies with any letter in the LGBT spectrum. All under this idea of queer. I, I find that more than anything now, actually, that the term that's being used is queer and that can encompass uh, an unlimited number of personalities, uh, identities, ways of living. Um, and if you dare to criticise anything associated with that, you are then by proxy criticising all of the other people within that umbrella. It's concerning because what it does is it shuts down debate, particularly over important issues like child safeguarding. And as far as I'm concerned, when it comes to child safeguarding, no conversation should ever be off the table. Not only is the conversation off the table in the public sphere for fear of losing your career, as I understand it, there's this dynamic when if a child presents as transgender, you cite the Australian cautionary tale where if the parents question it, I guess they could be at risk of losing custody of their children because they're, they're now officially bad parents. Uh, to resolve the issue, they go to a therapist. A therapist does anything except immediately affirm the child's presentation as transgender. They could lose their career. 
educators in school, same deal. It seems like an officially sanctioned firewall surrounding a child's idea that they're trans. Every authority figure is now bound by some kind of professional or criminal policing, even in the therapist's office. Gender dysphoria is real. I, I know people who are trans. It's fine. Like, it, it happens. I don't think you have to be transphobic to say this is a kind of scary thing you're, you're discussing here. Not at all. I mean, I, I previously kind of referred to this as a, as a whole scale attack on, on reality and society. But is it any wonder that we're seeing a worrying increase in the number of young children saying that they're trapped in the wrong bodies when we consider the way in which society is kind of embedded this ideology within it you know kids are going to school and i've seen the materials to prove this they're going to school and they are being taught that their sex was uh, assigned to them at birth that the doctor may have taken a guess at their sex the doctor might have got it wrong it's possible to be born in the wrong body they might send an email when they get home to someone from one of their favorite companies like a kind of customer service representative and they're confronted by that individual's pronouns in their email signature all of this grouping together to suggest to young people actually that you know everyone's got a unique inherent uh, gender identity and if you feel like you're in the wrong body we've got medication and surgery to treat that you're a man i'm a man we haven't shared pronouns but i'm going to go out on a limb <laughs> what is God, this, <laughs> this feels like such a woke question to ask, but, you know, here we are. What is the role of men in this discussion? Let's talk about our positionality as men, because I've had lots of people on this podcast to talk about this issue, almost always that they've been women, because women are most severely affected by it. They're most severely affected by the intrusion of male bodies into protected female spaces. And I think if you look at the data, social contagion, social pressure in regard to to gender uh, some private schools this has been documented being transgender is cool and being cis which is non-trans is like you're a muggle instead of being a trans wizard it's but it's primarily girls more than boys who are affected by it so i i like to point this out that although i, I have an opinion on this subject i'm never at risk or fear when i go into a locker room it doesn't bother me if women invade male sports leagues or you know, if I go to prison, I won't worry if a trans man is put in a cell with me. It's just men are not in the same kind of risk. Is this something you think about when you do have this discussion? I think it's very important, as you've just done, to distinguish the ways in which people are affected by this ideology, male and female. You know, I, I came into this issue in the first instance about children's well-being. Right. And children are children, male or female. They're vulnerable, whether they're boys or girls. So in, in that way, I guess the, the sex thing breaks down because all kids are vulnerable. Correct. So that's that's my starting point. However, and I, I do spend a lot of my time these days advocating and commentating on the ways in which women in particular are impacted, as you've as you've said, you know, their uh, safe spaces, fairness in sports, etc. So I strongly advocate around the fact that women in these areas are disproportionately impacted. However, I do not believe that that either means that I and other men should not speak out or don't have a right to speak out. And, and this is something that I've encountered. There have been a number of occasions in which I've been told by women to basically stay out of this because it doesn't concern me. There, there was one particular occasion which I was going to have, um, I was trying to organise a debate on a TV show in the UK against a, 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 a trans woman. You know, i.e. somebody who's biologically male and the host of that debate was also male and we were basically told we don't want to hear three blokes three three men speaking about issues that only affect women and i firstly i think that's highly unhelpful because at the end of the day we're all advocating on the same things here we're all trying to safeguard women's rights and children's welfare but but also i i just don't agree with it i i, t I always say that Every single one of us has skin in the game on this one, you know, and as men, we either have children or we've got family members who are children who are going through this or we've got sisters, or wives, or mothers who are impacted in their own way. The issue around free speech affects all of us and the general overarching point I make around this ideology taking over society, again, is something that all of us have to encounter on a daily basis. So I think it's very important that we recognise and stand up for the particular ways in which women are impacted by this ideology, but I do not believe that that means that men should stay out of it. And actually, 
I'm trying to encourage more and more men to speak up about this. Is it the case that you may never be able to practice therapy because of this issue? My reputation officially is kind of in tatters. But putting aside reputation, like if the regulatory body governing dentists says you're not fit to be a dentist, doesn't matter about your reputation, you're done. Is that the prospect that you face? Well, therapy is slightly different in the United Kingdom in that it, it, it isn't technically a, a regulated profession. And by that, I mean that anyone could, could legitimately put up a sign above their door that says therapist. Is there an accreditation that follows that? Like there are, Yes, there are accreditation bodies. They offer the training. You then can say that you're accredited by a registered organization. And that is basically what allows you to get jobs, for example, in the National Health Service. Someone tomorrow could just put a sign above the door saying therapist and start seeing clients. But if you want to actually operate within the field, as I say, offer work at the National Health Service and have any chance of actually succeeding, you know, ethically in this profession, you need to have gone through the accredited training and be registered with an accredited body. One of the bodies that I'm taking to course, who are called the United Kingdom Council for Psychotherapy, they are one of the largest accreditation bodies in the United Kingdom. Um, and as far as they're concerned, I am persona non grata. And so as things stand, I cannot see a scenario by which they would ever accept me onto their register. Culture wars go in cycles. So five years from now, we may be having a different conversation where, where people on the other side of this argument maybe are, are having trouble getting jobs because of things they've said. We'll have this conversation in a few years and we'll see about that. But one thing that has happened is that in the United States in particular, there are actually have been some people, therapists, psychoanalysts, who now specialize in a kind of, I'm not sure they would call it gender critical, but a more holistic way of treating families that have gender dysphoric children. And they look at underlying causes like trauma, maybe internalized homophobia, peer pressure, won't name names, but I mean, some of them have been on, on the Quillette podcast who that is now their niche, where they are the gender critical alternative to quote unquote affirmation based therapeutic options for gender dysphoric children. Is that something that would appeal to you? Because I take it a couple of years ago when you got into the profession, this wasn't your focus. You didn't want to be the gender critical therapist. But is, is that something, does the UK need people like that right now in this profession? Well, well, it does. And, and I agree. Unfortunately, we've developed this distinction between therapists who affirm and therapists who explore. I mean, that's often the buzzword, actually, that you can see on a therapist website, which will tell you which side of the ideological spectrum they sit on. That's the way it's kind of become. I don't think it's helpful myself because actually what I and other clinicians are calling for is simply to be able to practice the same ethical therapy that we would for any other mental health presentation. I don't believe that gender dysphoria requires special treatment by clinicians. I believe it should be treated the exact same way as we treat everything else, which is through open, honest, exploration. It's actually those on the other side pushing an affirmative approach who are asking for special treatment. And I, I often use the example of things like body dysmorphia or anorexia. But if a client comes into a therapist's office and says, I hate my body, I think I'm terribly obese, and I need my body to change, the therapist does not turn around to them and say, well, okay, if that's how you feel, then have you considered liposuction? And you that's exactly what we're doing here with gender dysphoria. They're coming in and saying, I don't like my body, I want to change it. And the therapist is expected to nod along and say, well, if that's the case, have you considered cross-sex hormones? Could it be the case that sometimes if the UK does pass this legislation in regard to so-called, so-called in the context of gender conversion therapy, that there will some therapist that will say, I'm sorry, I can't ethically treat you because treating your issues in an honest way would actually be a violation of the law. I think that's a real risk, unfortunately, and I've spoken with therapists from other jurisdictions which have passed similar legislation, and they now refuse to work with children with gender dysphoria for exactly that reason. But again, the infiltration of, an, of the ideology into the profession it runs even deeper than that. I, I often use this, this example, but I think it's particularly worrying. There's a group called the Coalition Against Conversion Therapy in the UK. That's a group of therapists and counsellors who they do what they say on the tin. They're trying to force through legislation banning conversion therapy. The chair of that organisation is a individual who identifies as non-binary. And that individual 
has previously said, and we've got the video to prove it, that if you're a therapist and you believe in two sexes, you should not see clients for therapy. This is on YouTube. It's as part of an interview panel discussion that they were taking part in. What was your reaction when, when you saw him say that? I mean, nothing should shock me anymore, but it, it shocked me. You know, in the United Kingdom, we have something called the Equality Act. It protects people from discrimination. And one of the core factors that it protects people regarding is belief, a religious belief or otherwise. And that also includes belief around sex and gender. And so for this individual who's got a lot of sway and power, unfortunately, for them to say, if you believe in biology, you shouldn't be, really be a therapist. It's crazy. So I'm looking at your social media profile. The bad news is, well, <laughs> we've led with the bad news. <laughs> But then I see that you started up a crowdfunded financial campaign to fight back legally against your university. You've already raised more than 110,000 pounds. On one hand, I think that's great. And it shows there's a lot of popular support. On the other hand, have you been accused of being like a profiteer or actually some of the people in the UK I've talked to on the subject, they're denounced as being front men for American evangelists and the radical right and, and so forth sort of on the subject of force teaming, it's like, well, you question gender affirmation, so you must be some kind of Christian religious zealot. Do you get that? All the time. It's, it's also interesting that nobody ever asks my pronouns. These are the same people who always request that you must ask pronouns. But as far as they're concerned, I'm just uh, a middle class male. From what I can tell, you're white on top of it. So, you know, you've got two strikes. Although, although interestingly, actually, myself and others are increasingly being referred to as Nazis. Right. I'm actually Jewish myself and have made that quite public previously. So, again, it's, it's, it's interesting that the people who have the hashtag be kind in their bio uh, on Twitter, it's interesting the type of things that they will say to those they disagree with. By the way, I'm also a stealth Jew, and I sometimes get called a Nazi for, you know, I mean, the hallmark of Jewish Nazis is that they believe in sexual dimorphism. One of the first things that we talk about at our uh, secret Passover ritual. Uh, it's actually unfortunate because my, my surname seems to play into their, uh, their little strange fantasies about that. So my surname is S's. It sounds like the German city of Essen. Yeah. Or I get called James SS. Oh, oh, I see. Right. So I get KKK, K-A-Y, get it? You, you can sympathize. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so this is, this is the plight of the modern Jew. Oh, also, I can say that when I went to a boys school back in the 80s, having a name that rhymed with gay was also just a, a delight. You've had a tough time of it over the years, John. My positionality requires maybe a whole further episode. <laughs> well, you know what? Maybe I should. You should put me on the ticker here for your on the therapist couch because I, I have a lot of issues myself. If I hadn't been chucked out of the therapy profession, John, I've got a few free sessions for sure. <laughs> well, a, free, a free trial at least. James S's. If people want to follow your work, where should they go? So you can find me on Twitter, where I'm frequently on, far more than my fiance would like me to be, and you just find. me. My name James S's. I've got a, a sub stack where I write on these issues. It's called Transparency. There's a link on that to my Twitter. And then if there are people listening who feel strongly about this and feel able to support my legal case, I also have a crowd justice page. I'm going to need to continue raising money for this because unfortunately, bringing litigation is, is very expensive. James S's, thank you so much for being on the Quillette podcast. Pleasure. Nice chatting, John. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Quillette Podcast. Quillette is where free thought lives. We are an independent, grassroots platform for heterodox ideas and fearless commentary. If you'd like to support the podcast, you can do so by going to quillette.com and becoming a paid subscriber. This subscription will also give you access to all our articles and early access to Quillette social events.